Hello God First, this week we are carrying on our series of heroes of the faith, digging into some of the people throughout history whose faith has been inspirational and through their example can teach us more about who God is and point us to him. Today we are looking at a person by the name of George Whitfield, and here he is. Looking half man, half sheep, presumably he too has just come out of lockdown and hasn't seen a barber for a while. Anyway, he was a local lad, born and brought up just in Gloucester in Southgate Street, uh, where his parents owned and ran a pub called the Bell Inn. George was born in 1714, so that's just over 300 years ago, which feels like a completely different world to today. However, there are some striking similarities between our Britain now and the one George was born into. When George was about five, Britain experienced an enormous financial crash. Sound familiar? The government of the day put all its eggs in one basket and had its national debt underwritten by something called the South Sea Company. To cut a long story short, the many Britons invested in the same company. The share price rose and rose and rose until late 1720 when the bubble burst. Just the other day there was a headline saying that due to coronavirus our GDP was going to slump by 14%. That's the biggest percentage for 300 years, only beaten by the South Sea bubble which took the biscuit when our GDP shrank by 15%. Another striking similarity was that 1700s Britain was experiencing what has been coined the gin craze. In contrast to our newfound obsession with the spirit, the gin back then was twice as strong and instead of adding edgy botanicals like bay leaf and cucumber, they would add sulfuric acid to give it a bit more bite. The cheap and readily available gin, the cheap and readily available gin led to rampant alcoholism prostitution was rife and there was a complete breakdown of family values. Society was a complete mess. One historian said the whole population was given over to an orgy of drunkenness which made the very name of Englishmen to stink in the nostrils of other nations. To add to this, Britain's moral compass was all over the place. The slave trade was in full flow and the divide between rich and poor was stark. So the question is, where was the church? Well, for the most part, it was asleep. Thomas Carlyle, writing at the end of the 1700s, described the country's condition as stomach well, soul extinct. Another historian said, both Anglicans and nonconformists seemed to at least agree on one point, and that was to let the devil alone and to do nothing for hearts and souls. Whitfield noted that the church was the shell and the shadow of religion. There was very little resemblance of the life-changing power of the gospel. In some ways, they had almost returned to pre-Reformation habits. Their concern was for the external show of faith, the focus on ritual, reverence and man-made protocol. This pushed people into two main categories, apathetic, those who didn't care, and ritualistic. The young George Whitfield chose option two. You couldn't fault him for his earnestness, but it bordered on obsessive. He said prayers and sang psalms three times a day. He visited the poor, received communion monthly and and would be found in Gloucester Cathedral on weekdays, despite the vicar sometimes being drunk. He even did such severe fasting it made him quite ill. George was desperate to take Christianity seriously. In 1732, at 18, George went up from Gloucester to the University of Oxford. In that city, at that time, there was a group of people who were trying earnestly to seek God. It was formed by two brothers called John and Charles Wesley, and it became known as the Holy Club. They were enacting the same processes as George. There was a strict regime of prayer, discussion of scripture, fasting, serving the poor, looking after orphans and zero indulgences in amusements or luxuries. Their fellow uh, university students mocked their fanaticism and called them Methodists, 
due to them living a life by strict rules or methods. For this group of friends, they were taking it seriously. They were seeking God with everything they were worth. They had what you could call a holy discontent, a feeling that perhaps you've experienced. You've perhaps had pangs of desperation at the brokenness that we see in the world around us. A desperation leading to not to hopelessness, but leaning on the truth that God brings renewal and yearning for him to intervene. In Deuteronomy 4.29, Moses is giving the Israelites a bit of a team talk. He explains to them that there could come a day when they turn away from God and start worshipping man-made idols and society becomes a mess. Moses' advice is, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek with him, seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's what Whitfield, the Wesley brothers and the Holy Club did. They were in a nation that had turned from God, so they decided to turn against the cultural tide and seek him with all their heart and all their soul. Their intentions were good. However, there was still a piece missing from the jigsaw. They hadn't yet grasped the necessity to accept the Holy Spirit into their lives, to be born again and to be transformed by Christ dwelling in them. All that was about to change. Let's take John Wesley. He was a committed Christian. He was committed to his faith. So much so he had travelled the six week journey to America to evangelise the native Indians. They didn't take to his religious rigours and he returned home despondent with his faith completely washed out. On the 24th of May 1732, he went to church in Aldersgate in London, and whilst the vicar was giving the sermon, Wesley noted that, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Whitfield, separately, whilst weary with his religiousness, had been given a book called The Heart of God in the Soul of Man. In it, it explains that true religion was a union of the soul with God, a real participation of the divine nature, the very image of God drawn upon the soul. Or in the Apostles' phrase, it is Christ formed within us. Having pondered this for a while, Whitfield too came to understand that to have a real relationship with God, to be transformed by him, you had to have the Holy Spirit in you for God to do the work. He accepted the free gift of salvation. He'd been born again. He joyfully wrote to a relative, I've found there is such thing as new birth. See, what Whitfield hadn't understood is our salvation isn't dependent on us. To have a relationship with God, you don't have to do more, you don't have to try harder, it's not a ladder to be climbed that you may or may not get to the top of. Through the death of Jesus Christ, it's a free gift given to us. Both men had experienced the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Wesley experienced what the Bible promises us in 1 John 4.13 when it says, This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. The Holy Spirit gave him assurance that he was saved and it gave him the faith to trust in Christ. The book that Whitfield read explains the Holy Spirit as the union of the soul with God, the very image of God drawn upon the soul. The work of the Holy Spirit isn't just like a can of Red Bull that excites and then fades. The effect is the uniting with God and the consequent transformation to look more like Jesus from the inside out. So what happened next? Well, in short, it all kicked off. God used Whitfield, the Wesley brothers and their fellow Methodists powerfully for an enormous spiritual revival. Whitfield went round America and Britain preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and the new birth on offer to them, and thousands upon thousands came to listen. 
I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account uh, of the timeline of his 34 years of ministry, um, but what I am going to give you is a few snapshots of Whitfield uh, and his preaching, the gospel, and how God moved. So after ordination, Whitfield's first sermon was in Gloucester in a church called St Mary de Crypt, um, and people thought his sermon was amazing and were powerfully filled by the Holy Spirit. Others complained to the bishop that he had driven 15 people mad, to which the bishop replied, I hope their madness lasts till next Sunday. On another occasion, Whit Whitfield tells of this time when he stood on top of a hill called Hannam Mount in Bristol. He watched the coal miners walking back from the pits to their homes, and he decided to preach the word of God to them. And when he started in February, only 200 would turn up. But by March, the number had reached 20,000. Whitfield says of the miners that, having no righteousness of their own to renounce, they were glad to hear of a Jesus who was friend to publicans and came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The first discovery of their being affected was the sight of the white gutters made by their tears, which plentifully fell down their black cheeks as they came out of their coal pits. Hundreds of them were soon brought under deep conviction. He preached in Moorfields in London. Back then it was a park some labelled a sat satanic playground for sin. Every evening thousands would come to enjoy bear baiting, wrestling, dog fights, prostitution and organised violence. As Whitfield entered the park, some threatened that if he preached, he wouldn't be leaving alive and the people smashed up his small wooden pla platform he was going to stand on. Undaunted, he gave a sermon to an estimated 20,000 people. They were in awed silence, and afterwards hundreds came up to him, seeking salvation. Whitfield preached in a place called Camberslang, just outside Glasgow, in front of 50,000 people. And these crowds weren't just calmly listening to his words and going home for Sunday lunch. The historian Pollock writes, they seem charged with divine electricity, a Pentecostal power which astonished even Whitfield. God moved in power and the people were gripped with conviction, repentance and weeping, turning to God. Whitfield was unstoppable. Sober estimates are that he spoke a thousand times a year for 30 years. That included at least 18,000 sermons. It was said that in general he would speak for 40 hours a week, and on many occasions 60 hours a week. That's six hour days, seven days a week. And on heavier weeks, that's eight hour days. And what was the effect? Well, the historian Bruce Atkinson says that literally hundreds of thousands of people were eternally saved through his preaching the word of God. That's a staggering amount of people considering the population of Britain at that time was about six and a half million. There is no doubt the Great Awakening, as it became to known, uh, as it became to be known, changed society in both America and Britain. American President Calvin Coolidge once said America was born in a revival of religion, and on the back of it were John Wesley and George Whitfield. In Britain, the revival cut across denominational lines and touched every class of society. Some historians have maintained that the revival so altered the course of English history that it probably saved England from the same kind of bloody revolution that took place in France. The many that had turned back to God helped to reset the nation's moral compass. It helped pave the way to form the Victorian values that Britain actually ended up becoming a beacon of, moral uprightness and enshrining the Christian values of justice and compassion for the poor. So where does that leave us? Well, what do you feel when listening to those stories of revival, of hundreds of thousands of people turning up hungry for Jesus? of lives being transformed by the power of God. Do we believe in the power of the gospel 
and the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit? Are we satisfied with the way the world is today? Are we okay with the lack of faith in the country, the fact that our family members, our friends, our colleagues don't know Jesus? Don't we want God to move powerfully again? There is a moment in the Old Testament in Chronicles 2.16 where it says that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Let's recommit our lives to God. Let's invite the Holy Spirit in and let's pray for faith and for revival. Let's pray. Lord, please bring revival. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us faith to believe the power in your life-changing gospel.